so I do want to change the, the pace of things. Um, I don't do much work directly dealing with health, but I do a lot of work with emerging technologies. And I was asked to talk a little bit around the idea of how individuals can begin to think about new technologies in addressing health and well-being. And so in this context, I want to tell you three stories, three tales, um, two of them hopefully uplifting and positive, one of them a bit of a cautionary tale. And I'm going to start by talking about poop. It's actually, actually OK, the first thing I realize is that this thing isn't working. There we go. I actually want to talk um, in this context about a, a relatively new technology called synthetic biology. Um, or extreme geoengineering. Um, not the sort of thing that many people would think about in terms of what you and I can actually get involved with. The sort of thing that we usually think about pristine labs um, and incredibly intelligent people doing things to engineer the genetic makeup of organisms. But we're actually seeing a revolution in this. Um, and that revolution is epitomized by one movement, which is the iGEM movement. iGEM stands for the International genetically engineered machine competition. This is a competition that was actually set up a few years ago to engage primarily undergraduates who didn't necessarily have any training at all in genetics to get involved in genetically engineering machines or organisms. And it's led to a number of things where people have begun to realize that as they begin to see organisms like bacteria as just another set of machines, they can work out how to develop the tools and hack those biological machines with some really interesting results. And I want to look at one particular team in particular. This is the 2009 team from the University of Cambridge that came up with a project that they called eChromi. And I'm going to give you three little snippets of video on this, which really begins to delve into their project. eChromi is an experimental collaboration between designers and scientists working in synthetic biology. In 2009, seven Cambridge University undergraduates spent the summer learning the tools of synthetic biology, which is essentially a new approach to genetic engineering. Using standardised sequences of DNA in a format that's called BioBricks, they learnt to engineer bacteria. They designed their own biobricks using genes copied from existing organisms, inserted them into E. coli, and created bacteria that secrete colours visible to the naked eye. So this was a team where they came together, they didn't really know anything too much about actually changing the genetic makeup of a microbe, but they had this idea that they wanted to re-engineer something so it actually produced a dye. Now, what do they do with that? This is an excerpt from Science Friday talking to, talking to Ira Flato a little bit after the competition, where they began to describe exactly what they were trying to achieve here. Well, I am part of the Cambridge 2009 iGEM team, and our project was called eChromi. And what we were trying to do is to improve bacterial biosensors. There are bacteria um, that can tell you the concentration of a pollutant in water. And they can do this because inside them they have a detector. So we developed um, two different parts, the sensitivity tuner, and this actually tells the detector when to turn on and when to turn off. So you have control over um, what level of the pollutant you're detecting. And how does the bacteria show that it's on or off? We use something called a color generator, which means that our bacteria changed color when the detector got switched on. Wow, so they light up in a different color. They actually change color it's visible to the naked eye. So let's say if you put a swab of the bacteria in the a polluted river, the bacteria would just change color. Yep, exactly. So you'd probably want to put a sample of your water on a bacterial plate, maybe not the other way around. <laughs> So this was the first phase of this, um, this really intriguing idea where they knew what they wanted to do. They wanted to create bacteria that would produce a colored dye in the presence of pollution, a really neat pollution indicator. And they learned themselves how to put together the different bits of pieces of genetic makeup to do that. But here comes the really interesting bit of this. They also teamed up with a couple of designers, James King and Daisy Ginsburg. And what those designers did is they pushed these students to stretch their imagination with what could potentially happen with this technology. And this is where things... As designers, we worked with the team to explore eChromite's potential as they were developing it in the lab. And together, we imagined the timeline proposing ways that living colour could evolve over the next century. These scenarios, some of which are shown in this film, explore the different agendas that could shape eChromite's use 
and in turn our everyday lives. One of the first real applications for this technology may arrive quite soon. A cheap disposable biosensor for testing groundwater contaminated by arsenic. Bacteria could also be used to produce natural colourings and dyes. By 2015 there may be a profession of people who hunt for new pigments in the genes responsible, bringing them back for use in the food and textile industry. By 2039 you can go to the supermarket and buy the simple probiotic yoghurt for cheap personalised disease monitoring. The yoghurt drink contains E. chromi bacteria, which establish a colony in your gut. They monitor for chemical signals that indicate the presence of a wide range of diseases. If they detect a disease, they start generating the corresponding coloured pigment, producing an easily visible output to prompt you to seek your doctor. So I love this idea. <laughs> and I love it because the concept is so simple. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to think about, well, if we've got bacteria that produce colours, in response to a, a certain external stimuli, why can't we even place those in our guts and get colored poop that tells us whether we're healthy or unhealthy? Um, and to me, it epitomizes this idea that everybody with a creative mind has got something to give to the process of making our health better. In this particular case, so this is obviously entirely speculative, but it's plausible technology. This idea actually made it around the world, and this was an exhibit in the Museum of Modern Art in, um, in New York. So they actually had this scatological exhibit of these colored poops. Uh, I, and I must, must emphasize here, these are simulated colored poops. They didn't actually sort of train somebody's gut to actually do this. Um, but it begins to demonstrate what happens when you begin to pull together people with lateral ideas the ability to engineer things and the ability to actually realize that idea into something. So that's the first tale, the tale of Color My Poop Beautiful. The second tale is a little bit of a cautionary tale, and it flips from the technology of synthetic biology to the technology of nanotechnology, and specifically the use of nanoscale silver particles. So silver is something that we've known for a couple of thousand years now to be an antimicrobial agent. The Romans used to use it. They used to make their mugs out of it, their, their cups, their chalices. They used to make their silverware out of it, in part because as the silver released ions, it began to kill some of the harmful bacteria. And this is an idea which has been gaining ground recently as people got excited about the new technology of nanotechnology, the ability to make stuff really small so we can use it in different ways. Um, and so you've seen over the last five years or so, more and more people beginning to use nanoparticles of silver to kill potentially harmful pathogens, including things like E. coli, and putting them everywhere. They've even ended up in things such as dietary supplements. So if you now go to Whole Foods um, or anywhere else like that, you can look at the shelf and you can see these bottles of colloidal nanoscale silver. This has actually been used for about 100 years now, but there's been an influx of people using this homemade DIY medicine rather than DIY health approach over the last few years, thinking that this is a new technology which is going to improve their lives. What is interesting about this, though, is you don't have to go to Whole Foods to buy this. You can make it at home. If you search the internet, you'll get examples like this. It's really easy to make colloidal silver. You just get this um, jar of electrolytes, you put your silver electrodes in, you pass a voltage through, and eventually you get a whole bunch of small silver particles there. Not only are people making it this at home, so this is a hack, pure and simple. People are actually using this. The trouble is, we're not actually quite sure what the health benefits are, but certainly there are some things which you don't want to happen. One particular case, if you have too much of this, you get the disease Algeria, it turns your skin blue. So this is one of those things where, I, and the point I want to make here is, this is a community that is developing a health hack in the absence of working with others. They think they know the answers, but they're not actually working with others. In this case, the results are maybe not that important. Your skin turns blue. On the other hand, if you've been following the news over the last few days, especially with the Ebola outbreak in Nigeria, there have been reports that people are intending to use nanosilver to try and cure Ebola patients. And this is where these isolated hacks get out of hand, where false hope is developed, because you do not have a community looking at how you can come together and come up with an effective health solution rather than something which is highly misleading. 
So that was the second. Oh, and if you want to know anything more about that, um, just check uh, my website, 2020 Science. There are more details about why this isn't really a good idea with nano silver. So that was the second tale, a cautionary tale about a hack and DIY medicine rather than health, which maybe isn't so good. But I want to finish with a third tale, which I'm guessing nobody has heard of here because this is really buried deep down in academia, but really fascinates me. And this is a tale that looks at the really big problem of exposure to air pollution, and in particular, particulate air pollution. So we have a picture here of somebody using solid fuel to cook in a developing economy. If you look at the, the estimates of how many people die as a result of exposure to smoke from fires like this, uh, there's a paper a few years ago that estimated somewhere around about four million people die as a result of exposures like this. Using solid fuel stoves in confined spaces is a tremendous problem. Ideally, to address it, we need a number of things. One of the things we need, though, is the ability to actually monitor the smoke coming from these and monitor the smoke that people are inhaling. The trouble is if you go to commercial instruments that measure these fine particles in the air, aerosol monitors, you're looking at anything upwards of $10,000 to $50,000 from these. Totally unavailable, unaccessible in these different economies. So a few years ago, a group at UC Berkeley got their heads together and tried to work out how they can actually address that. How could they, how could they come up with a really cheap exposure monitor that would be useful in situations like this? They ended up going down to their local Home Depot or whatever the local DIY place was and scouring the shelves, and they came up with this. I have a prop. $5 smoke monitor. And immediately it makes sense. We have something here which is designed to measure smoke in the air, set off an alarm. It costs five bucks. At the heart of this, in fact, I should be able to open it up. Should have checked this beforehand to work out which way it opens. I can't do it. You can have a look afterwards. In the heart of this, there is a little ionization monitor. It's a little chamber with a radioactive source in with a current that flows between two electrodes because of that, the ionization associated with that radioactive source. As very small smoke particles come into here, they suck up the ionized, the, the ions in there, and the current reduces. And so in principle, you can actually take this, you can strip it apart, you can pull that monitor out, you can measure the voltage coming out of that, you've got a smoke exposure monitor. And this is exactly what this group did. They took a $5 smoke detector and they hacked it to provide a very inexpensive way of actually monitoring and quantifying the amount of smoke people like this were being exposed to. So that's a hack. Um, they, they have a website. It's an academic website, which means pretty much nobody out of a sphere of about 20 people know about this. More people should know about this. But it's an incredible way of taking something off the shelf and utilizing it in a way which is very powerful. What really interests me about this, though, is how it can stimulate the imagination. So think through this from that particular example. You have a person or a group of people that have a particular health challenge. And maybe that health challenge, in this case, is going to be particulate air pollution. It's not only a developing economy challenge. It's also a major challenge here in the US. If you look at the figures with the number of people that have health issues or die eventually because of exposure to health pollution, it's massive. So we have this challenge. How can we go about finding hacked solutions to that? So you take the smoke alarm example. OK, we've immediately got a $5 sensor that maybe we can use to do this. Of course, it's very hard to use that on your own. You get a signal out of it. What on earth do you do with that signal? That is where it's so important to begin to collaborate with others, to work with others who know something about how to use that particular product, that particular signal, to get something useful out of it. Once you've got that, you can begin to hack this. You can begin to pull out the parts. You can begin to make something useful with that so you've got your smoke exposure monitor. That's what happened in the developing economies. But then think about what else you can do. And here, I'm a little embarrassed because I am going to talk about taking something like this and just attaching it to a smartphone, um, which isn't always the, the best solution. But you can imagine that you could very easily take that sensor out of there. You can configure it up so that that voltage goes into a smartphone. You've now got a portable smoke exposure meter. 
Then the really interesting thing is once you've got that, you can begin to crowdsource. You can begin to develop networks of people who are out there monitoring the quality of the air we breathe. That is valuable whether you're sitting in LA, whether you're sitting in Ann Arbor, whether you're sitting in Lagos or anywhere else. Now we have a community-based system for measuring exposure to air pollution, which immediately gives us the ability to begin managing that and coming up with innovative solutions to reducing that exposure. So with those three examples, and I just wanted to add, this hasn't been done yet. This is actually quite intriguing to me. It seems such an easy thing to do. Nobody, to my knowledge, has actually taken this very simple hack and created a very inexpensive particulate aerosol monitor that can be used outside these developing economies. So you take those three fairly simple stories, and I think there are some really clear messages that come out of them. And perhaps the dominant one is that everybody who is dealing with a health issue or is part of a community that is dealing with a health issue and who has imagination, who is creative, has an important role to play in developing solutions. It doesn't really matter who you are. You are an expert in your own world in seeing opportunities that other people can't see. But the second message here is that to transform those ideas into something that is useful and something which is there in reality, you have to work with communities. You have to partner with others that can fit in other bits of the jigsaw puzzle to get something working. If you don't do that, you end up with the nano silver situation where you are so blinkered you think you have a solution which is harmful. But beginning to work out where those connections are, finding that community that can really empower you to translate your ideas into something workable gives you the opportunity to build something which doesn't exist and actually move away from the limitations we have at the moment to actually getting to something which is going to be benefit your lives, benefit the lives of your community. And so the bottom line there is who on earth would have thought about colored poop? But once you see it, it's a brilliantly obvious idea. How many other brilliantly obvious ideas are there sitting in your heads and heads of other people in here that professionals like me just haven't heard of yet? Thank you.